Hi, Dr. Lyons here, of course. This video discusses the ductile to brittle transition in metals, which is really very, very cool. The Liberty ships were built during World War II primarily as cargo ships, although some did also carry troops. The U.S. built over 2,700 Liberty ships. A problem developed with some of the early ships. These uh, broke in half without warning and a sudden catastrophic fracture is called brittle fracture. In the investigation of these failures, a few things were noticed. One was that the ships tended to be in cold water and the cracks originated at stress concentrations. There was some sharp uh, corner or edge that initiated the crack and once the crack initiated, it propagated around the entire girth and the ships actually separated into two pieces as shown in this figure. So this is related to a property of some materials called the ductile to brittle transition temperature. Pure metals which have a transition temperature tend to have a very definite transition temperature called TDB. Uh, at temperatures greater than the ductile to brittle transition temperature, the material is ductile. And at temperatures below uh, the ductile to brittle transition temperature, the material is brittle. Iron uh, and other BCC metals tend to have a ductile to brittle transition. Almost all HCP metals have a ductile to brittle transition but face-centered cubic materials tend to not have ductile to brittle transition temperatures. They tend to remain ductile at all temperatures, at least known to us. Now, when we alloy the metal and create a solid solution or other type of alloy, the transition temperature tends to not be as uniquely or discreetly defined. Uh, the transition tends to occur over a finite temperature range rather than a specific temperature. The most common way that the ductile to brittle transition temperature is determined is with a Sharpie impact test. And this slide shows a couple of images of the test specimen. It's a little sample that's a couple inches long and there's a v-notch that's cut into one edge of the sample and that forms a stress concentration. The test specimen is put in an anvil in the test machine. The little white bar right here is the test specimen and it's supported at both ends. You can see that in this schematic right here the test specimen is supported by both ends and a hammer is raised and swings down and hits the back of the specimen causing it to fail from the notch. So it's a, an impact bending test with a notch in it. So here we see a, an actual test specimen um, viewed from above in the test fixture being supported at the two ends and the impact force comes in and whacks it right behind the V-notch. Now in terms of the test machine up here in the upper left hand corner, the main components are the anvil which supports the sample the hammer which impacts the sample and a scale and a pointer which is used to measure how much energy is absorbed. The hammer is originally raised to a height H. If there's no sample the hammer will swing down and then back up to the same height H assuming this is a frictionless bearing here. When you put a sample in the way of the hammer then energy is absorbed by the sample when it breaks and the more energy that is absorbed, the lower the final height H2. So if the sample didn't break at all, then all of the energy in the hammer would be absorbed by uh, deformation and vibrations in the sample, and the height would be zero. And if very little energy was absorbed, the hammer would whack the sample, hardly slow down at all, and swing up to a fairly high height. The scale would indicate the amount of energy that's absorbed. These two pictures that I've just added uh, show what a sample looks like if it's failed in a ductile mode on the left and a brittle mode on the right. In the ductile failure mode, we have a lot of deformation in the sample around the fracture, and all that uh, plastic deformation 
uh, absorbs energy. In the brittle fracture mode, you get cleavage from the fracture with very little deformation uh, in the sample. It just sample just breaks. Now, the absorption of energy during plastic de deformation that's associated with ductile failure is going to result in a high measured impact toughness. So we'd be up here in the top right part of the uh, toughness versus temperature curve. Uh, at a low temperature, the sample may be uh, brittle and low energy absorption, and we'd be down here in the brittle temperature range uh, on this chart. So the transition temperature is going to be somewhere between the temperature at which it's ductile and the temperature at which it's brittle. Here are some actual test results for some iron alloys. And we'll start with the graph on the top. And this chart shows impact energy versus temperature for plain carbon steels with different amounts of carbon. And here we have a low carbon steel. The uh, ductile to brittle transition temperature is around minus 50 degrees C. So low carbon steel is going to be ductile over the general operating range for uh, most mechanical engineering structures. And as we alloy the uh, material with increasing amounts of carbon, the transition temperature increases. So here at 0.2% carbon, the transition temperature is somewhere around minus 10 degrees C. Uh, here all the way at, up at 0.8% carbon, the transition temperature is around 150 degrees C. So the 0.8% carbon steel is going to be brittle at ambient temperatures because in its ductile to brittle transition temperature is around 150. So it's not going to become ductile until elevated temperatures are reached. So as the amount of carbon is increased in plain carbon steels, the ductile to brittle transition temperature increases. And you can see also the transition broadens. Essentially, it's broadening because the material is becoming more brittle at elevated temperatures. Other alloying elements have a different effect. The bottom chart shows how the ductile to brittle transition changes with increasing amounts of manganese. Here in this iron carbon manganese alloy with 0% manganese, the ductile to brittle transition temperature is around, um, say, 120 degrees C. And as the amount of manganese increases, the ductile to brittle transition temperature decreases. So which is better, to have an increase in the ductile to brittle transition temperature or a decrease in the ductile to brittle transition temperature? But generally, you want a low ductile to brittle transition temperature so that the material will be ductile at your operating range. And if it's ductile, you'll have some warning before it fails. If it's brittle, uh, the sample or the machine, the part will look fine until it fails. So you can see that the, the actual shapes of the curve um, depend on uh, the specific material that we're talking about. And that has led to different definitions of the ductile to brittle transition temperature. The ductile to brittle transition temperature can be defined as the temperature at which the Sharpie impact energy is the average of the upper and lower values. And that's what's illustrated in the figure on the right. The lower impact energy is about 25. The upper impact energy is about 85. And the average is around 55 or 56 degrees C. Another definition that has been used in reporting data is that the ductile to brittle transition temperature is the temperature at which the Sharpie impact energy has dropped by some percentage of the upper value. Some data will be reported as the temperature at which the fracture surface appears to be 100% ductile. So the result or the reported value of the ductile to brittle transition temperature actually depends on the definition. So that's something that's important to know when you're selecting or materials for a design. So that includes, and I hope that this was helpful.